We are online now. So two minutes and we start. Stimmt, gib mir mal bitte sein Kabel. Das ist ein guter Punkt. Gib mir bitte sein Kabel. Hier. Dr. Norbert. Yes. Okay. Uh, I have received uh, your same file one and two, like in, in the same, I, I haven't received the second part here. I got it from name one and name two, but I have received uh, same. I would send you the second part again, okay? Hold on. The second part is on its way. No, it's too big. The second part also is too big, uh, be probably because of the videos. It is just too big. Hold on. The second part is too big. Um, I have to go back in my slides. Okay. Um, Kann ich dich was fragen? Nein, du kannst mich nichts fragen. Du kannst das hier weg tun, dann hast du das hier. Diese Batterie ist leer, da hast du fast nichts mehr. Okay, Kann mach's bitte fest. Mach's fest. Mach's fest. Mach's, ja, ja. Nee, nee, hier, das wegmachen. Ja, nein, bitte. Mach's weg. Das ist so weh. Wenn du ein Video von meinem Video von meinem Seite hast, dann bin ich bereit. Anytime. Ja, ich kann das Video jetzt machen. Ich habe den Access auf das Video. I will send now, now the second video and uh, what we do is um, I think um, what we do is uh, if I need the videos I can ask for the videos extra because I could not include the videos in my PowerPoint presentation it, it is too big uh, well, but if have you have you uh, show it? Have you received four videos? Yes, I, have received. I have received. All right. So I can ask you then to start the video extra uh, okay. if you required. And I did uh, change my presentation to the slides without the video. So hopefully this is not this is in uh, this is twenty five megabytes. So it should be working. Um, uh, let, let us start, Professor Magdi, please. Uh, Good evening, everybody. I am Professor Magdi Bessuni, uh, General Surgery uh, Head of South German Hospital and Medical Director. Good evening. It's a pleasure for me today to join this Zoom webinar organized by Saudi German Hospital Academy. Our topic today is gastrocele reflux after sleeve gastrectomy. It's a subject of great importance as lap sleep became the most popular metabolic surgery procedure. Tens of thousands of procedures are performed in many countries worldwide. I have the honor today to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Norbert Brockel, Chairman and the Chief Surgeon of Pediatric and Metabolic Surgery, Sana Clinical Hospital, Germany. And our panelists, panelists today are Dr. Assam Harirati, Specialist General and Bariatric Surgery, Saudi General Hospital, Dubai. And also we welcome our uh, guest, Dr. Ammar Bilhawi, Assistant Professor, General Surgery Department and Consultant for Biliary and Liver Transplantation, Umar Qura University, Mecca. Uh, and he is a consultant in SGH. Jeddah. Now I would like to invite our uh, guest speaker, Professor Dr. Norbert Ronkel, to start his lecture. After that, we'll have the panel discussion and then we'll receive the questions of our, our uh, guests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Magby, for this kind invitation. I hope you can hear me clearly. I am um, proudly affiliated with the Saudi German Hospital Group, and this is my second 
presentation um, of a hot topic in bariatric surgery. And I hope that I can spark some discussions on this topic of reflux, which is being recognized uh, increasingly by bariatric surgeons. Can you see me well? All right, now this is my first slide. I'm talking about reflux after sleeve gastrectomy. Second slide, please. I can hear you. Sleeve gastrectomy is number one operation in bariatric surgery and considered by many as gold standard in bariatric surgery. Next slide. It has a profound impact on upper GI physiology and it also has a profound impact on the symptomatology of patients. This is a study from Riyadh, a clinical study on 213 patients operated on between 2009 and 2011 uh, with a sleeve gastrectomy. And they were examined one to four years after surgery using questionnaires. Heartburn, dysphagia, and regurgitations were the symptoms they investigated by the questionnaires. The graphic depicts the percentage of patients who improved their symptoms in blue color, who didn't see any change in symptoms, a red color, or who worsened, or who got de novo symptoms that is in green color. You would agree with me that a substantial fraction of patient experienced worsening or de novo heartburn, dysphagia, and regurgitation after sleeve. But there's also a, a, a good fraction of patients who experienced an improvement in their symptoms of heartburn after the operation. Next slide. The authors examined whether there were prognostic factors, variables that could predict the outcome, but none of the variables could strongly predict patients who would develop a new onset or experience worsening of symptoms post sleeve. They did not perform endoscopy, pH, resolution metry or manometry before. So we do not know whether patients with pre-existing silent reflux or pre-existing small hernias would be the patients at risk. This was just a study using questionnaires. But again, none of the variables could strongly predict the outcome after sleeve gastrectomy. Please, the next slide. What are the possible mechanisms um, of, in, de, uh, of, de, of a decreased uh, GERD after sleeve? There are functional possibilities, functional mechanisms like reduced abdominal pressure after weight loss, an accelerated gastric emptying, a decreased parietal cell mass, and a positive impact on lower, lower, uh, lower esophageal sphincter pressure. But there are also good reasons for an increased GERD rate after sleeve gastrectomy, functional ones, the low volume, high pressure system of sleeve, an impairment of the LES, a dysmotility of the sleeve with retrograde uh, propulsion, and obviously anatomical problems like a, a, an obstruction, a twist, a kinking of the sleeve, a retained fundus or antrum, or an unrecognized um, hiatal hernia. Next slide. Next slide, please. 
Hello? Hello? Next slide, thank you. That's fine. Uh, there are few studies now with sleeve gastrectomy being observed for more than 10 years. Uh, an Italian study examined 182 patients more than 10 years after sleeve. 43% of them developed de novo reflux and 2% had been converted to Rouen Y meanwhile. In China, uh, 65 patients were followed up for more than 10 years. 58% developed de novo GERD, 17% were converted to Rouen Y, six had hiatal hernia repair, and 50% were, were on PPI. Now, these studies from Rome and from China show me that probably worldwide, 50% of our sleeve patients develop de novo GERD on the long run. But the attitude towards operative correction is different. 2% were converted in Rome, 70% were converted in China. Next slide, please. This is a very important study from Austria. 43 patients were followed up for more than 10 years. 45% developed de novo heightal hernia. They had no preoperative GERD, please remember. 23% suffered from systematic from symptomatic reflux. 14% had been converted to Rouen Y for GERD, and 15% developed Barrett's metaplasia. This was a shock to our bariatric community. Next slide, please. So overall, these, these data from Felsenberg have been confirmed. We should state now that about 50% of our sleeve patients develop de novo GERD on the long run. 50% develop a hiatal hernia. And probably most patients with de novo GERD do have a hiatal hernia. 50% of patients develop metaplasia. But remember, Barrett's metaplasia is a short Barrett, and it has been gastric rather than intestinal metaplasia, and no dysplasia had been reported. But still, there are a few case reports of Barrett's carcinoma after the sleeve. These data are a bit worrying. They are so much worrying that the, the if so um, has stated a position paper just a few weeks ago. Endoscopy, they say, should be undertaken routinely at one year and then every two to three years to enable early detection of Barrett's carcinoma, Barrett's esophagus, or upper GI malignancy until more data is available to confirm the incidence of these cancers in practice. This is a warning sign nicely communicated. Please do follow up your patients by endoscopy until we have better data that confirm or disconfirm our worries. Next slide. There's one problem in the literature, which is the dis which is GERD and hiatal hernia. It, they are not the same, ladies and gentlemen. GERD is a functional problem. Hiatal hernia is an anatomical problem. They are usually linked, but not in every case. There's GERD without hiatal hernia, and there's hiatal hernia without reflux. The problem is that in practice and also in the literature, they are being examined either way, either GERD or hiatal hernia, and there's little data and, little and only a few studies that really try to examine both GERD and hiatal hernia. Next slide.
But the first international consensus conference that was published just a few weeks ago, they did uh, examine a GERD independent from hernia. It was a consensus conference that took place in Marseille a year ago. It was organized by Dr. Noka. Dr. Noka, who, he, he is a surgeon who promotes Nissen sleeve. And he organized this consensus meeting. First question regards pre-existing GERD without hernia in morbidly obese patients. Next slide. They asked, what is your first surgical option? And there was no consensus among the experts. Sleeve gastrectomy, 35%. Sleeve gastrectomy with anterior re reflux operation, 22%. Rouen Y, 31%. In pre-existing GERD, without hernia, but with severe esophagitis. What is the first surgical option, they asked the experts. And there was near consensus, the great majority of experts recommended to perform a rouen y gastric bypass, 68%, followed by sleeve plus anti-reflux in 90%, but most would not perform a sleeve gastrectomy in patients with pre-existing GERD plus esophagitis, esophagitis. Next slide. Now it's the, it's the other way around. We are now asking for pre-existing hernia without GERD. And this is the answer from the audience. Next slide. If there is a small hernia less than three centimeters, do you recommend higher till hernia repair concomitant with sleeve construction? Yes, near consensus, 66%. And if there is a large hernia pre-existing, what is your preferred surgical management? There's consensus to repair the hiatal hernia at the time of sleeve construction. Next slide. But ladies and gentlemen, there is no consensus on the best bariatric procedure in case of a pre-existing large hiatal hernia. Sleeve gastrectomy is being performed by a quarter of the experts. Sleeve gastrectomy plus anti-reflux procedure, another quarter. And a third would prefer a rouen y gastric bypass in a case with a pre-existing large hiatal hernia. So there is no consensus on what the best bariatric procedure is in that scenario. Next slide. Another question being placed uh, for the experts, would you consider sleeve gastrectomy plus anti-reflux procedure as a surgical option in the morbid obese patient with GERD symptoms. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Nissen, 77%, that was consensus, and Nissen sleeve, no for the teres ligament consensus, and no for the link system, also consensus. These are surprising answers because the high approval rate or for the Nissen sleeve is surprising. But please remember, this was an invited expert meeting by Dr. Noka, who is in favor of and promoting Nissen sleeve. So he invited the expert that uh, had a bias for this operation. Next slide. So the, the expert did recommend hiatal hernia repair concomitant with sleeve gastrectomy in patients with pre-existing large hernias. But there are others who are not confirming and who are opposing and who are worried and so am I because there are conflicting results from the literature. 
Next slide. I will show you just one paper. This is from Scott Shikora's group. They followed up 85% in whom they had performed therapeutic or prophylactic hydroplasty concomitantly with the sleeve. They followed up the patients for two years. And the group of patients who had preoperative symptoms and they had the simultaneous hydro hernia repair, 65% still got reflux symptoms after the operation. And in those patients who didn't have reflux before the operation and still got the hiatal hernia repaired, uh, they got 15% uh, uh, good symptoms thereafter. So the, the results show that hiatal hernia repair probably doesn't work at all. Next slide. Put things together. Concomitant hiatal hernia repair is suggested and recommended by experts in pre-existing hiatal hernias. However, there are conflicting results from the literature and this topic is not settled yet. I think it can be challenging, especially in super obese patients. And I do not want to add a risk to my bioretic patients. There are other anti-reflux techniques spreading like the Nissen sleeve, but yet we do not have conclusive data. The evidence is very low. And as I will show you in a moment, the high hiatal hernia repair post sleeve doesn't work at all. My very personal preference is therefore to perform hiatal hernia repair perhaps as a second step later, especially in super obese patients. I would do a long limb Rouen Y gastric bypass for severe reflux and a large hiatal hernia, or perhaps a one anastomosis gastric bypass for very mild reflux and a small hiatal hernia. But again, this is a topic for discussion and the data are not conclusive to have strong evidence. Next slide. Now let's look at the problem of GERD after a sleeve gastrectomy rather than concomitant. GERD after sleeve. Next slide. We may have to change to the second set of slides, please. Uh, again, this question was posed to the expert of the first international consensus conference from Marseille last year, published just a few weeks ago. Patients who develop severe GERD after sleeve gastrectomy and who have lost enough weight, what would you do? I lost the slide now. Yes, here it is. Uh, there is consensus to perform a Rouen Y 75%. Sleeve gastrectomy was not recommended. Only in a, in a minority would, would they do an anti-reflux sleeve. And in cases where the, where the patients had a, a, an, an, evid, an excessive weight loss of less than 25%, a sleeve was, was a, a, a Rouen Y gastric bypass was recommended in 84%. Next slide. Next slide. Thus, there's good recommend consensus for performing a Rouen Y in patients who develop severe reflux after sleeve. Next slide, please. Interestingly, this conference did not ask the question in, in, on what to do when a hiatal hernia develops after sleeve. And so no consensus statements were achieved. Next slide. Hiatal hernia after the operation may be de, de novo, mostly it is, but it may be, have been a, um, a pre-existing hiatal hernia that was unrecognized, undiagnosed, or even overlooked. 
This can be easily found and easily diagnosed by performing a CT scan. And you see on the left side that there's stomach or a sleeve above the diaphragm. But if you look carefully, you will see no, no clips, no staple line above the diaphragm. All the staple lines are below the diaphragm. Next slide. And this clearly shows that the, the, this, in this case, the hiatal hernia had been pre-existing and had been overlooked during the sleeve operation. Next slide. Post-sleeve hiatal hernia has been named intrathoracic gastric migration or intrathoracic sleeve migration. I personally do like this new name because it indicates that perhaps the pathogenesis of post-operative hiatal hernia is different in the bariatric population than in the non-bariatric population. And also please do remember that in, uh, in, in the cases with intrathoracic migration, they can have reflux, but a substantial number of patients will have signs of entrapment, pain, dysphagia. And we do have addressed both problems, reflux and, and entrapment. And it's my personal understanding and my personal experience that many do not recognize entrapment, entrapment signs as a sign of hiatal hernia or intrathoracic migration. Next slide. I am presenting now data from our own hospital because the recurrence rate after hiatal hernia repair is very high, I must admit. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve of the recurrence free survival in sleeve patients, the recurrence of hiatal hernia, the recurrence of intrathoracic gastric migration. And you do see a rapid decline in the curve. Within five years, 80% of all our patients do have a recurrence of their, of their hiatal hernia despite hiatal hernia repair. At most, recurrences occur within six to 12 months. And I think most hernias will probably occur within a few days and weeks after the hiatal hernia repair. What these, uh, this slide shows that hiatal hernia repair does not work at all in patients with sleeve gastrectomy. Next slide. So there's a high recurrence rate and recurrences occur early. Next slide. We performed the Cox regression analysis to see uh, and look for independent variables that predict um, a recurrence. We only found two variables. It's the hernia size. So the larger the hernia, the higher the risk of a recurrence. This is understandable, but also the type of hiatal hernia repair correlates with the recurrence. This is interesting. So surgeons do seem to have an impact by their technique. Next slide. What do I mean with types of hiatal hernia repair? Well, we perform standalone hydroplasty and combination hydroplasties. Hydroplasty was combined with conversion to raw and Y or end with the ligament terrace augmentation. Next slide. Now this is a video uh, of a simple suture hydroplasty, a posterior hydroplasty. Probably you all do the same. I just want to stress the point that you do have to mobilize the esophagus high up enough to bring down the cardia three to four centimeters. And I'm telling that because I've seen surgeons not doing enough preparation in the mediastinum, being afraid of the structures. But if you do not mobilize the hiatus, the, the hiatus 
uh, you do not mobilize the esophagus high enough, um, you do not have a good reposition. It is important to bring down the esophagus, the distal esophagus, and expose the esophagus to the abdominal pressure. Yes, please, next slide. Now, what is the ligament teres? The ligamentum teres hepatis is the lower border of the falciform ligament. It carries the umbilical vein. The lower two pictures are, are from a laparoscopic view. It's the base of the ligament at the liver. And, and the left side is the native view and the right side is the fluorescence ICG green color. The red arrow, ladies and gentlemen, show the ligamental artery, which, which comes from the liver, from the middle hepatic artery. So the ligamentum teres has its own blood supply from the liver, and this is the anatomical basis to create a flap, a vascularized flap, pediculated at the liver. Next slide. Now, this ligament uh, is then placed behind the left liver and behind the esophagus. It's pulled up in an upward left direction. And I would like to show this in a short video if possible. Is this video running? It is the second video uh, that I sent you. All right, I, I cannot hear you. I hope you can hear me. There should be a video uh, sent by WhatsApp. It's number two video, I guess. Well, Mm. It's taking some time to share the video, just Professor Norbert. All righty. Uh, just, just a minute, the uh, okay. sure. Um, this uh, this LTA position number one. Can you see this video, my screen? Uh, uh, not yet. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. You may start the video first and then share the screen, please. Do I have to do something or is it done by, uh, by Shopit? Uh, by Shopit is done. Okay. We have, just we have to wait. All right. Video is running from my end, but I'm not sure why uh, no one is able to see it. Can you see my screen now? Hello? Hello? 
Well, I do not see the film. Can you see my screen? Yes, I do. Yes, but the video is not running yet. No? No, I don't think it's running. If not, we proceed with the other, with the slides. Yes, and... please, uh, we can proceed to the second part of, uh, or, uh, of the presentation, please. All right. Um, so anyway, I, I have prepared a few uh, videos now, uh, which we have technical problems to show the videos. Um, this ligamentarius augmentation is a simple operation. So you, you firstly dissect the ligament uh, from the uh, falciform ligament and then from the anterior wall down to the umbilicus. And you will have about 20, 20 centimeters of a ligament, a fatty, nice ligament that has been pulled upwards to the left, behind the left liver and behind the esophagus. Next slide, please. This is an anatomical sketch. So the ligament is now pulled behind the esophagus. The ligament now is being fixed to the crura on both sides to have an augmented hydroplasty. Then the ligament is being uh, fixed to the esophagus about three to four centimeters above the cardia. And then uh, the ligament is being fixed to the cardia on both sides. The ligament is being spread out to have a long esophagus being stretched into the abdomen. You have a free end of, of the ligament that is longer in one case than in the other. You may wrap the ligament end around the distal esophagus, but I do try to avoid a 360 degree wrap because I'm afraid of obstruction of dysphagia. So I only wrap it uh, 270 degrees or even less. Next slide. Let's come back to the Heitel Hernia repair. There are several elements of this repair and they have a different purpose each. Hyatoplasty alone or hydroplasty um, um, has the purpose of bringing down the cardia and enforcing the crura. The addition of the Ruan Y conversion is an anti-reflux operation. Ruan Y is very effective in managing reflux. And the terrace ligament is not an anti-reflux procedure as one would have thought years ago, but the sole purpose of the ligament is to anchor the cardia and to prevent the re-migration, the recurrence. So three elements, reposition, cruel enforcement, anti-reflux and anchoring. Three elements of a complex hiatal hernia repair. Next slide. These are our data uh, which have been uh, retrospectively analyzed. It's five year. We did 307 hiatal hernia repairs in our entire erratic group, including sleeve, including one anastomosis bypass, including Ruan Y. But we could perform a nice mathematical statistical analysis with the entire group. We had hydroplasty alone, hydroplasty with Ruan Y, hydroplasty with the ligament, and hydroplasty with Ruan Y and the ligament. And these are our recurrence rates. Next slide. As shown before, hydroplasty alone has a very high recurrence rate of 75%. Hydroplasty with Ruan Y conversion 
has a 64% recurrence rate. It's not very much better. But the ligament, the addition of the ligament brings down the recurrence rate to about 15%. And these numbers are significant. Next slide. Here we add our Kaplan wire curve. Um, and we have two groups, those with and those without the ligament. And you clearly see the difference. Without the ligament, a very low, a very high recurrence rate. The curves are better um, in patients with the sleeve, with the ligament. You also see that we do not have long-term data. So our conclusion is that adding the ligament teres to hiatal hernia repair reduces the rate of early recurrences. But at this very moment, we do not know the long-term durability of this ligament. Next slide. I would like to conclude with the following summaries. GERD and hiatal hernia are frequent sequelae after sleeve gastrectomy occurring in about 50% of patients on the long run. GERD is mostly caused by hiatal hernia which is intrathoracic gastric migration, but not in all patients. Hiatal hernia or intrathoracic migration may cause reflux, but it also may cause entrapment. So please check for both symptoms and treat them accordingly. Reflux is a functional problem. Entrapment is an anatomical problem. Treat the patient's symptoms and anatomical findings both at the same time. Next slide. Pre existing GERD without hiatal hernia, there's no consensus on the appropriate bariatric operation. I personally prefer the Rouen Y gastric bypass. Pre-existing hiatal hernia without reflux. The consensus recommended concomitant hiatal hernia repair, but there was no consensus on the appropriate bariatric procedure, sleeve, sleeve nissen, or room by gastric bypass. My personal recommendation is performing a Rouen Y gastric bypass in a larger hernia, a smaller hernia, probably a one anastomosis bypass is fine. And I would usually delay hiatal hernia repair if required as a second step procedure, especially in cases with super obesity. And actually most cases we have are super obese. Good, without intrathoracic migration after sleeve, there's a clear pro for the conversion into a rule on Y situation. But if you have GERD with intrathoracic migration after sleeve, there has been no consensus, but my data and my recommendation would be hiatal hernia repair, conversion to rule on Y plus anchoring the cardia with the ligament teres. And I thank you so much for listening to me. I truly apologize everybody for the technical problems, but um, uh, show it and all the team has really tried hard to get the problems I have here facing with our system in, in, in Europe. Um, please do, do, do uh, uh, respect my apologies. And thanks again for, for the technical support uh, over in, uh, in, in your place of the world. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor Ronkel, for this condensed review of uh, the most common complication of the sleeve gastrectomy. Really, it is so serious if we know that 50% already of the morbid obese patients have already reflux before operation. So if this problem increased after they uh, suffered and uh, did uh, sleep, so uh, thanks a lot for describing the management and details and I would like to ask our guests uh, Dr. Hassan and Dr. Amar for any comments about this uh, lecture. 
Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Norbert. It was an excellent presentation. You have enlightened very important um, topic. So thank you so much for the effort and thank you so much for the fresh updates that you have uh, mentioned in your presentation. Actually, I have questions and comments. First of all, I will comment on the percentages that you have mentioned in your presentation. Um, I would like to uh, show the other, the other side of the problem. It's true that nowadays everybody is talking about GERD and sleeve gastrectomy. Some studies may uh, have biased numbers, some studies may have small specimen, a small number of patients to be studied, some uh, may be biased by the preference of the, of the uh, researchers and so on. Um, actually, I, I just want to show the other, I mean, I mean the other side of the percentage. Um, in front of me, there is um, a systematic review and meta-analysis has been published in February 2020, just a fresh one, which is talking about 10,718 patients studied for the same problem, for the, for the uh, distal esophagus uh, changes and the problem of reflux with the sleeve gastrectomy. And the percentage is far less than you have mentioned. The percentage of, of GERD was 19% and de novo was 23%. And the percentage of um, esophagitis was 28%, and the barrio, uh, sorry, and the Barrett's esophagus was only 8%. And this may come to my mind that it can explain why we are not seeing too much esophageal cancer. If we have, I mean, such big numbers of Barrett's esophagus and severe esophagitis, why we are not uh, seeing that there is an increased number of esophageal cancer after sleeve gastrectomy. This is contradiction between the number of Barrett's and the number of cancer we are diagnosing. So yes, some, some studies show this, and this will, 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 will give us an idea about this controversial studies that the problem is very complicated. It's a multifactorial problem, something related to the technique, some, some is related to the anatomy, some is related to the physiology and function and the pressures. And so it's many, many factors are playing role to, to I mean, um, induce the problem of reflux after sleeve gastrectomy. I'm sorry for that, but I just want to, to enlighten the other way, I mean, the other side of the problem. I agree with you. I fully agree with you that the sleeve gastrectomy will increase or worsen the problem of, of reflux. And it's contraindicated when there is a severe esophagitis. And it's contraindicated when there is a Barrett's esophagus. I fully agree with you. But I mean, I think there was some exaggeration in the, in the percentages and the numbers. My second. Um, uh, could, we, could we just, um, I'm, I'm, I, otherwise, yeah, I forget. Yeah, please, please. I think please. Thank you so very much. And I think you're right because we all have this kind of uh, um, strange feeling because we are, get all these high numbers from the literature. But as a practical surgeon, these problems, we do not face so much problems in daily practice. And we hardly have ever seen a Barrett's. And I myself perform endoscopy in many cases. Uh, regularly, I'm an, I, I, do, I do endoscopy all my patients, but I do not remember any case of Barrett's in my person sleeve patients. But please do remember that the high number of the high number of Barrett's have been reported in the three studies that had a, um, a surveillance of more than ten years, and the meta analysis. The, uh, the meta analysis. I think the observation period was about five years or even less. Um, now, you're right, they may, the, the, the studies are small numbers that may have been, they may exaggerate uh, the problem, but the problem is such that the if so itself has been buried. And they have, yeah, yeah agree. They have, agree. They have, agree. they have, they have place this kind of warning. And I think it's very important that we all, that the bariatric surgeons do not close the eyes that we are open. Uh, we do have to check our patients. We have to bring them back in the hospital. 
uh, 10 years later or back into, in, into the endoscopy suite, we do have to be alert, we do have to check and hopefully we all see the numbers coming down um, with a larger series. Um, and we all hope that because the sleeve is a very effective operation, it would be a shame if uh, there would be a kind of boresome cancerous problem with the sleeve because yes. it's, a, it's a great solution for, for patients throughout the world. That's my comment on that. Yeah, that's my answer. And my, and my second note is regarding the, the mini gastric bypass. Um, you've mentioned in your presentations that, that if there's a mild uh, or the small hiatal hernia or a mild reflux, you don't mind to have a mini gastric bypass for a patient. My opinion in this, I'm, I don't agree with you, with all my <laughs> respect, with all my respect. Yeah. <laughs> I, have seen, I, have severe, I have seen very severe and bad bile reflux after mini gastric bypass. And it's also a very problematic thing. So in my opinion, the ruin why gastric bypass is the good choice when we are going to consider another bariatric surgery other than the sleeve gastrectomy for a reflux problem not the mini gastric bypass, please, because I have seen a lot, a lot of complications coming from this bile reflux and uh, any, any following the, the mini gastric bypass. My third and, fine, and final uh, note is about links. I saw that many experts were not voting for, for links, but do you think this is because they are not expert in using it, or do you think that because it has complications? Because you know, when we are voting to to something, when we we are considering something, um, it is related to our experience. It's related to our, to, uh, I mean, to our opinion. So, in my opinion, because the links, the magnetic ring is not so much, I mean, marketed in the market, and it's and it's restricted, and it's still up till now. I'm trying to get the links magnetic ring to Dubai for two years now. And I was not able to because of the restrictions, because of, of the licensing, because of the company doesn't want to do that because the company is so conservative. I don't know what's the problem, but I think our opinion regarding the links is still too early to say no or yes, because very, 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 I mean, um, uh, small number of surgeons are, are experts in it, very small, uh, a number of surgeons are using it. So I think there's a bias with no. I think so. I don't know what's your opinion about that. Oh, I think you you are very knowledgeable, sir. And you have, uh, you have splendid remarks. I think that is exactly the point. Uh, the ex there were no experts. Uh, uh, there were no experts with the link. And that's the comment also in the discussion of the paper. They voted against the link because they were not using link and they have no personal experience with the link system. So the link system may have a future and perhaps uh, there should be a conference with experts that are using links so we get more information about that. And this actually is the same problem with the MGB or the mini gastric, uh, the one anastomosis gastric bypass. There has been an international consensus conference with enthusiasts, uh, with the one anastomosis bypass enthusiasts. And they were stating last year that in mild reflux and in the small hernia, the mini gastric bypass is a fine operation. So if you have all these con consensus conference, the answer is according to the setup of the experts. Um, and, and we are such a wonderfully new uh, field in surgery, the bibretic, uh, operation, uh, the bariatric surgery is a new field uh, spreading into different uh, groups, uh, bringing new information every other day. Uh, the information can only be gathered from all sides and from all experts with different experience. Um, yes, bring, please bring in the, your experience with the link system. There may be future, because it remembers me a bit, a little bit um, with the terrace ligament. The link system holds the cardia uh, really intra-abdominally, it can be, there could not be a, re a, a recurrence of the hernia uh, in, in, inside the thorax, but I personally have no experience with the links and I leave the opinion to the others who have more experience with that. Uh, I have one question okay, regarding the hiatal hernia. So, so you, um, please, if you have any uh, feedback, please. 
Thank you, Professor Norbert, for your kind and uh, remarkable presentation with uh, very fresh knowledge. I'm just wondering about the manometry. What is the role of manometry in playing of choosing between the sleep gastrectomy and uh, gastric bypass? This is a very important question you are addressing. The question is, which patient gets a uh, GERD after sleeve? Can we identify the patients beforehand? Can we select the patients? And one could speculate whether patients with a pre-existing silent reflux or with a pre-existing small hernia are the patients prone to get reflux thereafter. And if so, one could choose the patients by preoperative manometry. Uh, we don't know. I just uh, clearly say we do not know. The consensus conference, they said we do not have to do manometry or PMA, pH metry before the operation, but probably this is more for a practical reason, because in practice it's very difficult for surgeons to get these investigations done. They are, uh, they need high resources. Usually we do not have these techniques in our surgical departments. They are in the departments of the gastroenterologists. We have no chance to, to have our patients systematically studied. Uh, so at this time, at this time uh, we, we do not know, um, and it's unrealistic to have every sleeve patients being investigated by manometry. We do, do not know. Further studies have to show. Because you know, the, uh, where, I, where I was trained in Strasbourg in France, uh, they are more familiar with gastric bypass and there was a routine for every bariatric patient, every obese patient gonna go, gonna do bariatric surgery. He has to go through the manometry. It's a rule was uh, there in Strasbourg in hospital where, where I was trained. That's why I was asking the question. Well, um, I think uh, you and myself, I have no chance to get these uh, investigations being performed. Uh, in my patients, perhaps I would like to do them uh, to have this in a kind of a study setting, but in clinical routine practice, we we have too many patients, uh, they do not get manom manometry in, in practical day, daily practice. Okay, I think uh, you have any question more, Dr. Uh, Amar, because Dr. Assam, I think, has a, another uh, question. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Assam, if you please. Okay, my question is regarding the hiatal hernia. You mentioned that the majority of reflux after sleep gastrectomy is related to the hiatal hernia. So what, what strategy you, you follow in order to distinguish this or to, to see this hiatal hernia before the surgery? What are you doing? We only perform endoscopy, which is, uh, which is a simple, straightforward. Uh, we surgeons do it, and I have a different view uh, uh, then gastroenterologists. I think it's pretty easy to diagnose a hiatal hernia before the operation because you do inversion and you can, you can see it with a fair amount of good uh, expertise. You can identify patients with, with a hiatal hernia before the sleeve. Uh, to diagnose a hiatal hernia after sleeve is much more complicated. It's my experience that physicians do overlook, they do not know how a hiatal hernia looks like in the sleeve patients. And then we also combine it with a CT scan. So we also always perform an endoscopy plus CT scan after sleeve, but before the operation, we just do simple upper GI endoscopy. So you don't explore the hiatus unless you have an evidence that there is a hiatal hernia, right? Exactly. Exactly, because actually there are some, including myself, who think that the exploration of the hiatus promotes rather than prevents the hiatal hernia because aggressive manipulation, it destroys the retraction system. It may destroy and is, if it, the dissection of the gastrophrenic ligament, it may harm rather than. So I am very hesitant uh, uh, to explore the hiatus. And please do remember that most patients I have are, uh, are super obese. 
and I'm just happy to get out of the operation to have the patients done. It's very, very, comp it's very difficult for my hands to explore the hiatus in a in a super obese man. Uh, man. So I just I just leave it and and see because there are about 30, twenty to thirty percent of sleeve patients who improve after the operation. Do not uh, please remember, sir, that uh, sleeve gastrectomy can improve uh, reflux. So why don't we wait and say, and if the patient does develop reflux later, I go back and do a second stage operation, may convert him, may repair the hiatal hernia then. It's easier because he has lost, uh, he has lost his weight then. As, as, as a conclusion, we don't explore the hiatus unless there is a, an evidence before the surgery that there is a, a hiatal hernia. I would agree with you. Uh, okay, Professor Ronkin, we have a question from our uh, guests. Uh, can overeating or eat, uh, weightlifting can cause intrathoracic migration after sleep? Uh, we do not know, but I do recommend our patients uh, not to increase their intra-abdominal pressure by sport uh, or by athletics four to six weeks after the operation. Um, but this is just a kind of recommendation that we know from general surgery when we explore the hiatus. Uh, we, I think everybody, uh, every surgeon has a case or two of a patient who um, has experienced a sudden pain when lifting or when doing a sport and he has, and, and the heart hernia has um, recurred in that very moment. But these are just case reports, and I do not know any, any systematic study on that. Um, but I would be happy to share the experience with others. OK, uh, Professor Ronkel, uh, thank you. And uh, just I want to highlight a point you mentioned in your uh, lecture about the ticks and during surgery itself for sleeve like uh, using uh, the measurement, it's not so small. Uh, some use uh, 28, which makes a very small uh, stomach, and also leaving a big pouch or making sinus of the stomach or the rotation by taking antero and posterior or uh, missing hernia. All these uh, ticks during surgery, I think if we take care of them, uh, it can at least uh, minimize uh, now I ask if any of our panelists have any uh, uh, other point to discuss or conclusion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, professors and our panelists. And uh, really, it was uh, a nice uh, discussion. And uh, thanks all. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have proudly presented uh, my presentation. I thank uh, you and the moderators, and I do thank um, Shobe Jane for um, getting my technical problems organized. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all again. Thank you so much, and goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Robert.